yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. In 1941, with the outbreak of war, millions of Americans answered the call. From every town and hamlet and city, they left their jobs and homes and sweethearts and headed for Europe or the Far East. Some were idealistic, some went unwillingly. Most had no choice. Some looked upon it as the adventure of their lives, and for one man, that adventure would become legendary. Well, now, I'm bored, and whenever I get bored, I'm always dangerous. J. Curtis Goldie Goldman was part of an elite airborne fighting force that few Americans at the time knew even existed. Goldie was among the 5,000 strong, all volunteer force known as the Glider Pilots, nicknamed by some suicide jockeys. The American Glider Pilots spearheaded nearly every Allied offensive after Sicily and landed only behind enemy lines, always in the hottest part of the war zone. At South Plains Army Air Base, site of one of the many glider pilot training facilities, and now home to Lubbock International Airport in Lubbock, Texas, resides the Silent Wings Museum, a fitting tribute to this little known part of American military history. Yeah, that really is. Working with Goldie and also working with the other glider pilot veterans that I worked with on my previous film, it really, it really strikes you that these men were a different breed. <laughs> some call them crazy, uh, some call them brave, they're both. Uh, and, but to me, they're all heroes because they volunteered for a job that no one wanted. It was, they knew it going in, in training. It was essentially labeled a suicide mission. And that draws a certain individual to uh, serve in that capacity. Well, I think I'm gonna like it. Well, I love this. Bring back all the memories. All of us wanted to be in combat. That's what we got in this bit. We knew what we were getting into. We knew that it was one of the most dangerous things in World War II, if not the most dangerous thing as far as the casualty rate is concerned. We were a small drop in a huge, huge bucket. The only ones that knew we existed were the airborne. The rest of them never knew we existed at all. We got no recognition. We uh, were unappreciated. We were unrewarded. We were the unsoldiers of World War II. It truly be said, we were the unsoldiers of World War II. Born February 13, 1923, in San Angelo, Texas, Goldie characterizes his boyhood as a cocky little brat looking for a fight. That fighting spirit may have come from his father, John C. Goldman who served in the famous Rainbow Division during the Great War. His school years in Tyler, Texas were filled with boyish mischief. And when war broke out in 41, he felt World War II would be the adventure of a lifetime. He wanted to be front and center in the action. I wanted to be a fighter pilot, and my heart was set on that. And I passed the physical exam. I passed everything in my eyesight, 20 40 eyesight, so that wiped me out as far as pilot training is concerned. So I came back over in the old buck sergeant. He said, uh, Kid, we'll give you a waiver 
if you'll fly gliders. Now, I never heard the word glider. So I said, what's glider? Hell, kid, it's flying. Take it or leave it. So I took it, and right there that day, he swore me in, and I was in the U.S. Army Air Corps that day. Now, my parents didn't even know what I was doing. I graduated from Tyler Junior College just the day before. And so uh, I walked back home, and I made a mistake telling my mother that I enlisted. Well, as far as she is concerned, I was dead already. Training for glider pilots took place in stages at bases all over the United States. In June 1942, 19-year-old Goldie's journey began at Randolph Field in San Antonio, Texas. I was born cocky. Now, when we got to Randolph Field, there was a large archway sign, and it said, Suicide Squads. Well, I saw that Suicide Squads, and my cocky quotient grew exponentially. I became arrogant, uh, insolent, insulting, you name it. Due to a clerical error with the spelling of his name, he did not get paid for four months. But to Goldie, that turned out to be a blessing in disguise. I don't have a first name, it's just the initial J, and then Curtis Goldman. And then the payroll department changed to Curtis J. Goldman. So for the first month, I didn't get my $40. Second month, I didn't get my $40. Third month, I didn't get my $40. Now, Elvin Dever Miller was my best buddy there. And so we'd go into San Antonio every weekend. We didn't have any responsibility. All I did was play softball and things like that. Now, if I'd got my $40, I'd have spent it just like Miller did because when Miller left uh, Randolph Field, he was broke. But they paid me eight $20 bills. I had $160 in my pocket. I didn't know that much money in the world. We had an eight-hour stop in Chicago when I went to a camera shop. I bought a German-made Foss Derby camera for $85. That was the most expensive camera they had. Fold it up, it fit right in my shirt pocket, and I started taking pictures immediately. I took pictures all the time I was here in the States. I took pictures overseas. I took pictures in combat. I carried that camera with me everywhere. Now that J made it possible for me to have $180 to buy the camera, and that J is providential. Goldie began primary flight training in September at Rochester, Minnesota. I was in Rochester, Minnesota. I'd never been in a plane in all my life. I cranked the plane up and got in the front seat, and then the instructor, he got 500 feet of altitude, got two or three miles away, and then he pulled it up in a power stall. It dropped off and went down, and he looped it right off the deck, just barely missing the ground, and then he said, did it scare you, kid? I said, no, man, it was exciting. That surprised him because he said he did that with everyone and all the rest of them, it scared the hell out of them. But it didn't scare me, it just excited me. And he said, don't ever do this. I'm a professional stunt pilot. There is no room for error. After flight training in Rochester, it was on to Okmulgee, Oklahoma for dead stick training in preparation for actual glider flying. For their final dead stick test, the instructor informed Goldie's group that at least 50% of the pilots would wash out that day. We laughed at him because we didn't feel like that near that number were going to wipe out. So we got about 15 minutes away from the field. He said, do a two turn spin to the left. I said, sir, Air Force regulations say you're not doing aerobatic maneuvers. He said, I don't know what the regulations say, do a two turn spin to the left. So uh, I gunned that thing in the, in, in the full throttle, pulled it up into a power stall, and then hit that left rudder, and that baby started going down. And I did the full two turns, and then just we got out of the bottom of it, he said, let me have it. So I let him have it. And he didn't say anything. My heart sank within me because I thought, man, what a fool I was. I broke regulations. I was just sick at heart. We got back, he got out, and he said, kid, you made it. I said, I did. I said, ah. He said, we were only testing for guts, and the ones that do the full two turns got washed out. 50% of them washed out that day. 
I wasn't one of the fifty percent. That's the first time that I heard the G stands for guts. But that's the thing we were most proud of. People see that. What are those G wings? I say the G stands for guts. We had more guts than anybody in World War II. Was general, my general answer on that. The G stands for guts. I salute guts. Next stop for Goldie was Greenville, South Carolina, and learning to fly sailplanes and gliders. By this time, Goldie was developing a reputation as one of the more daring trainees. His almost stunt pilot-like fearlessness was becoming well known to his superiors. Later during the war, one unsuspecting glider mechanic found out firsthand how exciting flying with Goldie could be. Uh, one of the guys there named James Fox, he had ridden with a number of the glider pilots. He was always asking me, he said, hey, Mr. Goldman, I want to ride with you. They say you're the most exciting guy here. So I got in a Piper Cub. Now when I pulled up in a power stall, Fox didn't say anything. When that thing dropped off in that power stall, I thought Fox was going to blow his lungs out. He's screaming, take me back, take me back. And he reached up and got a hold of those two uh, bars up there on the front of that thing. So I came back. We had to unglue Fox. He couldn't turn loose. His hands were stuck there. And I said, Fox, I thought you were on a thrill. He said, I got a thrill for a lifetime. I'll never get another plane long I live. After Greenville, Goldie was transferred to Adams Field in Little Rock, Arkansas, where he reunited with his good buddy, Eldon Mueller. From there, it was on to South Plains Army Airfield and Lubbock, Texas, where Goldie was about to graduate from advanced glider training. It was here the pilots practiced blitz landings, simulating surprise landings on a combat zone from low altitude. After South Plains, Goldie moved on to Louisville, Kentucky, where he completed his formal glider education. At Louisville, he would meet the man who would later in the war save him from certain court-martial. I was the first one over this barracks, and so there was a room in that barracks, so I decided, well, hey, I'll have a chance to have my own room. Had two bunks in there. So this guy sticks his head in and said, anybody else got this bunk? I said, nope, I was reading a magazine. And then he came in and threw his blouse down with those captain boards on it, so man, I popped up, snapped to attention. He started laughing, he said, I'm Douglas Brown, and I said, I'm Goldie. We meshed right there that day at Bowman Field. He had been a trial lawyer in Denver, Colorado. Goldie's temptation to fly with wild abandon continued at Louisville with the time he decided to fly under a bridge on the Ohio River and another time when he pancaked a Piper Cub onto the deck while shooting dead stick landings. The last stop in Goldie's glider training was Lornburg Maxton Base in North Carolina, where the glider pilots would practice crash landings, something Goldie was already familiar with. They also practiced the infield glider retrieval method known as snatch takeoffs. Well, a snatch takeoff is the glider is still on the ground. Now there's a loop over here on two poles, and then the tow plane comes and it's got a hook it's on that loop. It's a very dangerous maneuver. In a matter of one second, you're jerked off the ground. This is a snatch right here now. It's the backside of it. Here's the way it was now. Look here, just as soon as that thing hit that thing, you start doing like that. Now, your knees up here by your ears. Your, e your knees are up here by your ears. And I'm telling you, and, and you're rocking that thing just, just like this until it gets steady. Now, if you push it forward too much, then you're dead. If you pull it back too much, it pulls up, and then you're dead too. So you, it, you just quit rock, just like this. The fact is, they only took volunteers. They would explain it to you, and then they would do a snatch with, with me sitting in the co-pilot seat and then the guy that was training us would do it to show us how. And then when it came time for us to go, we were in there by ourselves. Nobody else in it but us because if we messed up, then we wouldn't kill anybody else. 
It's sort of like that. No motors, no parachutes, no second chances. With training finally over in April 1944, Goldie sailed out of Boston Harbor, bound for Liverpool. 12 out of the 15 days crossing the North Atlantic, storms lashed the ship. Goldie, along with Major Doug Brown and friend Alden Mueller, however, had the good fortune to be assigned to a stateroom. This had been a French luxury liner before the war. And it had been stripped down to accommodate, and I think it carried about four or 5,000 troops, but they were all down below decks. Now, I don't know how he managed it, but Captain Brown uh, had me and him and Elder Mueller on the top thing, right up there where the captain of the ship was. We had a little kitchen in there. We had our own toilet in there. We ate in the captain's mess hall. The North Atlantic, it was storming. I mean, all the way across, 15 days, it stormed. I went down below one time, and that was enough for me. Man, I was in there for about five minutes, and I thought I was gonna throw up. I got out of there. Upon arriving in England, Goldie was assigned to the 99th Squadron, 441st Troop Carrier Group, and they settled into their home base, Merrifield in Taunton, England, right across the channel from Normandy. At Merrifield, Goldie's passion for pushing the envelope continued. In one incident, he would unwittingly give a two-star general who had never flown in a glider the ride of his life. I was on long tow. John Hurley was on short tow. He had a major general sitting in the co-pilot seat. So I just thought I'd have a little fun. So I sneaked my glider over under his right wing and then pulled it up like that. Evidently, the major general must have cussed me out because when I got back down and landed, Hurley got out of his glider and he came at me. And we met, and both of us got in a couple, three loads before they separated us. But then the MPs got there too about that same time. And they escorted me to Major Morris. Now that was my introduction to Major Morris. It was not a happy introduction. Major Morris said on that occasion, Goldman, I ought to court-martial you. If you do anything like that again, I will court-martial you. So that was my first threat of being court-martialed by Major Morris. Goldie's antics in the air and his penchant for getting into trouble ultimately would lead to the biggest disappointment of his life. When I first got over there, they checked us out in the big British horse glider. That British horse glider was the largest plane in all the Allied forces until the B-29 came along later in the Pacific. That thing carried four Jeeps in it, and it was huge. They had to tow that thing about 140 miles an hour, and then when they slowed down with the tow, it slowed down about 65 or 70, and then they pulled on those dive flaps and pulled that thing straight down. When they did that, I'd jump out of that window and sit on that wheel and hold on to the wing strut. And then when it landed, it just practically stopped. I'd jump off, then I'd run up and get one up ahead so I could get another ride, you know. And uh, so that was fun. For Goldie, though, the fun was about to end during a glider demonstration for the top military brass. Well, it's about a week before D-Day. There were six gliders with six or eight 82nd Airborne paratroopers in it. Now, Ralph Phillips was flying pilot Captain Blackie Bowman had let me fly co-pilot, ordering Ralph not to let me fly, period, because he's afraid I'd do something idiotic. It's supposed to be about a 45 minute flight, 500 feet uh, altitude, a beautiful day, and we were just circling. So the 45 minutes turned into an hour and 45 minutes, turned into two hours, turned into three hours. We just keep circling, and we're coming around over the stadium. And so finally, I got bored. And whenever I get bored, I'm always dangerous. And I always go brain dead when I'm bored. And so I think, well, I'm gonna climb out. So I took the window thing out of that little V-shaped window. And fortunately, I'm small enough where I can stick my head and my shoulders out. 
I forgot that thing was going 120 miles an hour. That's hurricane force. That's top hurricane force. I got my head and my shoulders out, and then the wind sucked the rest of me out. Now, you see where that window is? Now, in the glider, the two or three different manufacturers made these gliders. Now, the glider and the one that when I crawled out that window, it was right up this way, just about under here. But the wing stroke was just like that. And that wind just sucked my whole body out. I was fortunate to be able to grab onto this, and then my body is horizontal to the plane, 120 mile an hour wind. Then the 82nd Airborne Corporal was hanging out there trying to grab hold of my legs. And so there were a few moments that was quite exciting. They grabbed a hold of his body and the rest of them were holding on to his body so he, he, uh, he wouldn't get blown out. And while we were flying over, and they tell me that Winston Churchill was there, General Eisenhower was there, all the big brass, the Allied forces there, about 600 of them, they see this idiot with hanging on to a wing strut with his paratrooper trying to get a hold of one leg. And finally, he got a hold of one leg and they got me and him back in the glider. When I got back in the glider, I started laughing and then Ralph Phillips was flying it and he cussed me out. He said a few naughty words about me. We were good friends in the same tent. The only time Phil ever cussed me out. And then when we landed, sure enough, the MPs are waiting for me. Back to Major Marsh. That time he didn't even threaten me to court Marsh. He just said, get the hell out of my sight. I don't want to see you again. You're restricted to base. It had been Goldie's wildest ride to date, and he had not yet even seen combat. Goldie's reputation had caught up to him. His squadron commander, Captain Robert Blackie Bauman, informed him he was too irresponsible and that he would not take the chance that Goldie would do something foolish on the mission. Goldie would not fly on D-Day. That's the reason I miss D-Day. My biggest disappointment in World War II was because of that one idiotic stunt. The most powerful invasion air force ever launched. Some of the 11,000 planes that opened the path through the so-called impregnable Atlantic Wall. Between Laube and Cherbourg in Normandy, the Allied lightning strikes. Yank paratroopers receive last-minute instructions before taking off for the invasion coast 100 miles across the English Channel. Another set of brave men board gliders. These are the heroes who established first contact with the enemy. Mueller made D-Day. He got back and then he phoned me and said, Goldie, meet me up at Western Supermare. I got a three-day pass. So I went to Captain Bowman and he gave me a three-day pass. Miller was already there when I got there. He had already had a hotel. We checked in, put all our stuff in there. And then we went down to a restaurant. It's getting just dusky dark, and we ordered our food. And then two MPs came in and said, uh, Flight Officer Jay Curtis Goldman in here? I said, yes, you come with us. I said, why? We have orders to bring you back to your base. I said, what did I do wrong? You didn't do anything wrong, sir. We have orders to bring you back to the base. I said, I just ordered my food. Can I eat my food? They said, no, you can't eat your food. We have orders to take you immediately back to your base, get you there as quick as we can. They took me right in to Colonel Williams, and he said, Goldie, go out and get in the plane, C-47. And then we took off. None of us knew where we were going or what was up. And so about an hour or two after that, a captain that was on the plane, he came back and he gave us scissors and said, cut all of your insignia off your uniform." He said, now don't tell anybody that you're a glider pilot. Goldie and his fellow pilots were on their way to Casablanca, North Africa, and the next glider operation, Operation Dragoon. We arrived at Casablanca 120 degrees. We were all in winter uniforms. 
we immediately got in a hanger in the shade, and most of us, I know I took all my clothes off, including my boots and my socks. Casablanca was a hothouse of spies. German spies, Italian spies, American spies, English spies. Man, we didn't know at the time, but they told us that it was. They said, don't say a word, it's your glider pilot. Don't even talk among yourselves, it's your glider pilot. It's a secret mission. Operation Dragoon, Goli's first taste of actual combat, was the critically important Allied invasion of southern France. Well, we landed in a little town named Le Moui. Me and Don Mankey, he's flying pilot, I was flying co-pilot. We were the very lead glider. Don picked out what he thought was a nice grassy field. We're about 15 feet from that thing, and I saw poles stuck up, and I saw that these were large stumps with a diameter of about 16 or 18 inches, and those things stood up about three or four feet tall. So I screamed, get your feet up. We stopped instantly. It tore the whole bottom out of that glider. And I mean, we carried in a heavy machine gun crew. It's three pieces of that thing, plus the ammunition. That thing was going all over the place. A lot of those guys got there got bruised, but no bone were broken. We couldn't see anything. Dirt, I mean dirt, just balled up inside that glider. They started stumbling out, and I stumbled out. And those guys, they hugged me and Don Mankey. I mean, those guys grabbed us and hugged us. In all, hundreds of gliders participated in the invasion, and it was considered a great success. There were about 500 Germans garrisoned there at Lemoy. Now we got into town and we met instant resistance. Now they were holed up in these houses. So in the building where there were Germans, then we went in and dug them out. The last group of Germans was in a large building, a three-story building across the railroad track, and then there was a peach orchard down through there. And I was on the glider pod and said it went in to fight. The rest of the guys just sitting out there waiting, enjoying themselves, eating, eating peaches and fruit. I was the only one that went in. Now I threw three or four hand grenades. I shot my Thompson submachine gun, all but one clip power. I don't know if I killed anybody. Goldie returned to Merrifield to prepare for his next assignment. No one knew, except higher command, that the next airborne operation would be the biggest glider operation of the entire war. It would be called Market Garden, the airborne invasion of Holland. It was a daring strategic maneuver that hinged upon the last bridge at Arnhem being captured. Well, in our Market Garden, often called the bridge too far, was uh, Montgomery's idea. It was a brilliant idea. Had succeeded. It would have ended World War II no later than the end of October 1944, saving millions and millions and millions of people. Now he was known as the hero of El Alamein, and he was Britain's hero. He was a great general, but he was an egotistical jackass. There had been plenty of reports from the Dutch underground of German panzers massing near Arnhem, but Monty, not trusting the Dutch, chose to ignore them. His assessment that the German army would be too demoralized to fight would prove tragically inaccurate. My glider had about a 1,500-pound overload. I carried in with me Staff Sergeant Paul Stark, and then a the guy, Zettner was his name. Now, Zettner had never been in a glider. He was scared to death before we ever took off. So we were bouncing around like crazy, and, and Zettner's back there screaming as we were getting into this thing. Then Paul Stark yelled at me. He said, I've been praying. I just looked at him. He said, you know what I'm praying for? I'm praying that, that if we get hit, that I'll get hit instead of you. I sort of looked at him. I said, why? He said, I don't know how to fly this damn thing. <laughs> and so both of us started laughing. Zedner never did see the humor in that. 
For Market Garden, the glider pilots were handicapped by a lack of compasses and a lack of proper maps. Few were ever informed of the actual airborne deployment areas. For most, the only thing they had were the instruments in their gliders. But even those were of little value. In the training process, we thought that this was important. But once we got over to Europe, hey, listen, we forgot the instruments. The instrument, if we weren't able to fly this thing without instruments, then we didn't have any business being there. Because now, when you're flying in combat, if you got to use instruments, you're dead before you ever start. Goldie's instincts as an aviator were about to be tested to the fullest during the frantic confusion of landing in Holland. We saw several planes get hit, and they went down. We saw several planes get hit, and they went down. So when I cut loose at 1,000 feet, I meant to make a complete circle. I had to dive that thing because our cut loose speed was generally about 60 miles an hour. To keep from stalling, I was going 100 miles an hour. I only made a part of a circle. I could see this field had been plowed recently, and I meant to land going to the furs. I landed right in the furs, 90 degrees. It's one of the things didn't tip over. I held it up, held the nose up as long as I could, and then it just dropped and it stopped. There were explosions going on. Mortar shells were hitting all around. So we got the Jeep loose, Paul Stark was driving it, and I mean, Paul came out of there zigzagging that thing because those mortar shells, they saw us coming out. They were determined they were gonna get us. Close by was a wooded area alongside the road. Paul pulled into the wooded area and stopped, and I saw one of the guys in full fire first. I said, hey, is Mueller here? My buddy Mueller answered me. There he was. The two of us together again for the first time in months. We were 13 days back of enemy lines back there. It really took a special breed of individual to become a combat glider pilot. They were the only aviators in World War II that actually flew in. They were all rated pilots, and they flew in, and once they got on the ground, they became infantry. Basically, you know, joining up with units and fighting on their own and just helping where they could. They were like free operators. They weren't with any unit. No other pilots uh, in the Army Air Corps, which became the Air Force, did that. And uh, you have to have a lot of respect for that. We were the first American soldier of any kind to go into Grossbeck, Holland, and they greeted us with a great greeting. Me and Mueller and Bud Menzel decided to go down to Nijmegen and see what was going on down there. Getting just about dusky dark, and the ME-109 came across, and we were out in an open field. We looked up, and we saw this guy from 500 feet, just leisurely flying. He had a grin on his face that spoke louder than words. We all three threw down our weapons, and we started running for the woods. He could have killed us if he'd wanted to. He just thought he'd have a little fun. He waited we got in the woods, and he cut loose with those seven machine guns, three in each wing and one in the nose. Man, I'm telling you, I don't know about Mueller and Menzel, but I wet my britches, man. That scared the living hell out of me. If you've ever been strafed by an ME-109, you know what scare is. Goldie and his fellow troopers not only had to worry about Germans in the air, but were blissfully unaware of the thousands of Germans crawling the woods. They were literally surrounded. Me and Mueller and Bud Menzel, we sort of got control of ourselves a little bit. Now, here comes a jeep bearing down the road with a corporal from the 82nd Airborne. So he stopped and he said, uh, are there any Germans up ahead there at Grossbeck? I said, oh no, we had a big celebration there this morning. He said, you guys better get in here. I came through a couple of German patrols. You keep going that direction, you probably get killed or captured. So we hopped in the jeep. And we come over this, uh, off this uh, plateau, sort of an S-turn coming down to Grossbeck. And there were about 10,000 armed German soldiers, at least that's what it looked like. They were all over the place. He slowly weaved through, careful not to hit him. They never said a word, we never said a word. And then for a length of about two city blocks, we were through. 
He stuck his foot through the firewall. He burned rubber on that Jeep. He let out a few expertise, which I'll not repeat right now. But you guys said there were no Germans. Well, there weren't any there when we left. And I was still half paralyzed. So was Miller and Bud Menzel. Years later, Goldie would write an article for the Glider Pilots newsletter about this incident. Bill Horn, the editor, felt it stretched the limits of believability, publishing the article with the heading, A Glider Pilot's Tall Tale. He didn't believe this really happened. He said, I never heard of anything like this happening. I said, well, Bill, whether you heard about it or not, it happened. In 1991, a pictorial memorial book was released called World War II Glider Pilots, and on page 119, a quote appeared from Goldie's buddy, Bud Menzel. I was going through that thing, and there's Bud Menzel in there, and he said, the most remarkable thing that ever happened to me was just at dusky dark, riding through a little Dutch town named Grosbeck, filled with armed German soldiers. So my testimony is there. Aside from those few close calls, Goldie's military career seemed to him to be the adventure he had envisioned. Storm clouds were looming, however. Well, Major Morris was our ranking officer among the glider pilots there. There were about 60 of us there. We were in a wooded area, but it was a nice, smooth dirt, very comfortable. And there were, I guess, about 100, 150 82nd Airborne troopers. And we sort of bedded down there for the night and the next morning. And it's getting about noon. Now, by the time we bedded down there the night before, Morris had started digging a hole. We thought he might be tunneling to China. And so then the paratroopers got orders to move out. So they fixed up their gear and started doing halftime down the road. So uh, Captain uh, Bowers walked towards Major Morris. Major Morris is sitting on the edge of his hole. And he said, Major Morris, I think we ought to go. He said, no, I'm going to stay here. And then another lieutenant that I didn't know walked over, and same thing. Well, I stood up, and I said, well, I know him. I'll walk over there. And just as I got there, a flight of American P-47s flew over about 15,000 feet. Now, we knew they were American planes for the sound of the motors. Just as I got there to the hole, Morris jumps down in his hole. He's in the bottom of his hole, and he's screaming at me, get away, get away, get away. Now, never in my life I had such contempt for a human being. Morris was a strong man, didn't have any guts. He had a yellow streak down in the back of the yard wide. I let out a few choice cuss words, and I said, if you guys want to stay here with Morris, it's up to you. I'm going to the paratrooper. I picked up my gear, and I started doing a halftime. All the rest of the guys did, too. When Morris realized that he was there all alone by himself, he got out of the hole. And he came. He didn't talk to any rest of them. Stayed all by himself, but he hated my guts. Goldie and Morris would not meet again until 10 months later. Morris had a very good memory. On December 16, 1944, Hitler's powerful Ardennes Offensive, or Battle of the Bulge, struck the Allies completely by surprise. Hitler's plan was to split the Allied armies in half. Hitler thought that with that and with the flying bombs and things like that that they were working on then, and then to have the jet airplanes that they had already built and were ready to go, that they could still win the war. By December 21st, German forces had completely surrounded the vital crossroad town of Bastogne, trapping the 101st Airborne and the Command B of the 10th Armored Division. One of the only ways to get supplies in was by glider. We had nine gliders in the 99th outfit that were scheduled to go whenever the weather cleared up. Two of them were carrying gasoline. Now I volunteered to fly one of those gasoline loaded gliders. And then the other gliders carried other equipment. They had pilot and co-pilot. And we only had a pilot because if he got wasted, you only lose one man. The uh, CO of the 440th outfit had only been on one mission all the time we went over there, and he raised hell and commotion wanting to go on that mission. Well, I was really disappointed because I really wanted to go on that mission. I'd been cheated out two or three other missions. I was one of my big disappointments. They cheated me out of that one. 
Of the roughly 100 gliders launched, only 65 reached Bastogne, a 35% mission loss rate and one of the highest of World War II. The last glider touched down 15 minutes ahead of Patton's armored breakthrough of the encircling German lines. In February 1945, once again Goldie and his best friend Mueller got together, this time to celebrate their mutual birthdays. Our birthdays were both on February the 13th. Mueller was two years older than me and a whole lot bigger than me. The next morning, Mueller had to go back to his outfit. We went down to motor pool. He stepped up to get in the cab of the truck, turned around, I reached up, we shook hands, said, take care of yourself, you big lug. He said, take care of yourself, you little squirt. I didn't know at that moment. I'd never see him again. So a long way later, he was dead. But I didn't know this. He's in heaven. And I want to see him again someday when I get there too. The Allies sensed the war would not last much longer in the European theater. The crossing into Germany was the final task. Second only in magnitude to the Normandy invasion, Varsity, the airborne component of General Montgomery's plunder campaign, would become the toughest and most dangerous assignment yet for glider pilots, and Goldie knew it. Early that morning, a guy came through calling for the Catholic guys to come to Mass. And I woke up, I'm laying on my back, and a cold chill came over me. I thought, it'd be a hell of a thing if I got killed here on the last mission. I turned over on my stomach, and the only prayer I knew. Now I lay me down to sleep and pray the Lord my soul to keep. And then I made God a few promises I was going to straighten up and fly right. They fed a steak for breakfast that morning. First time I had steak for breakfast in my life. And then we went on the flight line. And then while we away, mail truck came up. And this one guy in a package from home it had four cans, number two and a half cans of fruit cocktail. He said, what in the hell am I going to do with this fruit cocktail? I said, hey, give me one of them. I put it down between me and Don Mackey. Taking off from 17 airfields in north-central France and 11 airfields in southeastern England, the Grand Offensive was not coming as a surprise to the German high command. Most glider pilot missions, the objective was to bring the paratroopers in and the equipment behind enemy lines so they could, you know, filter in behind the Germans. But the varsity mission, the last major mission that the glider pilots flew, they actually had to fly and land on top of the German positions. <laughs> and while the Germans, you know, knew about them and were well entrenched. Large numbers of German troops and new anti-aircraft guns were positioned in all conceivable landing zones and the Allied glider pilot's mission was to land right on top of them. Now, Don Mackey is one of my best friends, but uh, Don, was a, he was a steady glider pilot. You could depend on Don. Don would not do anything foolish or rash ever, even in his practice flying. And, but he was an excellent pilot. We came in about a thousand feet of altitude. You couldn't see the ground. They were doing smoke pods and burning everything. It was just complete cover down there. Dawn was flying. I cut the thing loose at about 800 feet altitude. We didn't see the ground until we were about 250 feet down. Just before we hit the ground, it sounded like a huge popcorn machine went off the back. German machine gun bullets in the fuselage right back of the major who was a surgeon 
and his two orderlies who were enlisted men, that thing was just totally straight. And then we hit the ground, and then there was a 17th Airborne guy lying flat. We ran over his body. I still hear that sickening crunch. I, I screamed out, I said, Don, you hit one of, our, one of the paratroopers. He said, I know it, Goldie. And he got that thing stopped. And then I kicked out the window, and I dived out, and I had clips of submachine gun bullets. My pants pocket hung on that clip and stopped me. In that split second, a burst of German machine gun bullets came under my head, at least no further than an inch away. Had I not caught on that, it blown my head clean off my body. And then I dropped down. And then Don Mankey says, I was running like a dog and he was running standing up and he claims that I was running that way and I beat him to this big hole, this German emplacement about the size of a large grave and we fell in there. And my Thompson submachine gun turned out to be a number two and a half can of fruit cocktail. Goldie's landing was spectacular, but even more dramatic was the landing made by glider pilots John Hefner and Bruce Merriman. Incredibly, no one in the glider was injured, including the stunned driver of the Jeep, which careened out of the plane. We were there, and I mean all hell was breaking loose. There were machine guns, there were mortars, they had tanks there in the area, and the 17th Airborne cussing like you've never heard. The German, I'm assuming, were cussing too. And I'm just sitting there in the corner holding my can of fruit cocktail. Just an amazing fact that I, I think people should really keep in mind when they think about the service of the glider pilots, that until the end of the war, their responsibilities were unimaginable. And the bravery was, you know, really something we, we should appreciate today. The end of World War II brought celebrations to war-weary France. Every soldier to the civilian was a hero, including Goldie. And the fact that he spoke with a Texas twang elevated his stature even higher. In Paris and in small towns in France, he played cowboy. Goldie was welcomed with open arms during his victory tours. With the war ended, Goldie and his fellow pilots had more than their share of time on their hands. And one day, Goldie and a fellow pilot, Stumpy Norman, decided to get into a friendly but foolish dogfight with two Piper Cubs. We had orders, except for takeoff and landing, to fly at 2,000 feet altitude, level flying, and no deviation from that. Well, that type of flying is boring, and I don't enjoy being bored. So, I told Stumpy, I said, Stumpy, it lets me and you have a little fun. Okay, go ahead. So when we took off, we never do get up at 2,000 feet. We probably never got up over 800 feet. So we're dogfighting. I'm on Stumpy's tail. And we come to a little French village. Great big wide street and a whole bunch of Frenchmen down there in that street. Stumpy is in front, so I follow his lead. He bounces his wheels off the street. A lot of those people were flat on their bellies on the street. And he pulled up to about 250 feet, I guess. And I'm about 200 feet. And then Stumpy does a wing over like that. I do a wing over like that. I'm right here, and I know I'm too low. I know I'm going to crash. So I cut the switch off that thing because I don't want any electricity. If the gasoline and uh, crash broke the gasoline tank and caught that thing on fire. Well, I hit it about this angle. The plane bounced back up in the air, fell on his tail, broke the tail off right back of me. I got out of that thing as quick as I could. Stumpy's still trying to shake me. He doesn't know I have been shaked. I mean, I have been shaped. Goldie, dazed, wandered back to a small French village and was welcomed with wine and a celebration began. It all ended at 10 p.m. that night when the MPs found him. The next morning, Goldie found himself under arrest and in front of Major Morris yet again. Morris called me every dirty, foul name in the book. I think he may have been in three or four. And he said, I'm going to prefer general court martial charges against you 
I'm going to see to it that you get this arm or discharged. I'm going to see to it you spend the rest of your life in a military penitentiary, and if I have anything to do with it, preferable to that, I'm going to see to it that you come before the firing squad. There were six different charges against me, all of which I was guilty. This was serious, and Goldie knew it. Goldie appealed to the CO of the 99th Troop Carrier Group, Colonel Williams, and provided the history between Major Morris and Goldie. Williams promised to get Goldie out of this very serious jam. He said, Goldie, we'll get you the best defense lawyer in the ETO. I said, I don't know who that is. Major Douglas Brown. He's a trial judge advocate for Wayne. Goldie's friend, Captain Brown, now a major, was at headquarters within hours. And after listening to Goldie's entire story, as well as the incident at Grosbeek, Brown said he would be appointing himself as prosecuting attorney and assured Goldie that the verdict would be not guilty. He called Colonel Williams and said, I have burned the court martial paper. Now, nothing like that has ever happened in all the animal warfare. That was a major crime. If anybody had seen him do that or known that he had done that, he would have been court martial. Major Douglas Brown loved a kid named Goldie so much that he's willing to put his life on the line for me. Colonel Williams informed Goldie shortly thereafter of the not guilty verdict coming through and was ready with the papers for Goldie to ship home the next day. And all thought it best he get out of the ETO as quickly as possible. In August 1945, Goldie returned to the States and soon met Catherine Ruth Avon, the woman who would share his life. Catherine influenced Goldie to attend church where he discovered his life's calling. In 1947, to the surprise of almost everyone, Goldie decided to dedicate his life to the Lord and preach the Word of God. He built the Temple Baptist Church in Albuquerque, New Mexico with his own hands and recently retired after 50 years of preaching to his congregation. We were the unknown soldiers. There were only 5,000 of us in the first place. Only about 3,000 of us were ever in combat. Now, the paratroopers have gotten a lot of publicity, and they deserve every bit of the publicity that they've gotten. Those guys have got guts. They are truly a band of brothers. Every time I meet a paratrooper, I salute them, I salute them. And, uh, and they will tell you that we had guts. We also were a band of brothers, but we never got any publicity. Very few people know about us. I tell people I'm a combat glider pilot. You're what? A lot of the military don't know. The only ones that really knew for years and years and years were those that rode in our glider. As a gift from family and friends and from Temple Baptist Church, a wax figure of J. Curtis Goldman resides in a place of honor at the Silent Wings Museum in Lubbock, Texas a symbol of sacrifice and service to this nation in the name of freedom. For Goldie and all the glider pilots who bravely served during the Second World War, you have earned our nation's lasting gratitude. I was a kid at heart, and for me it was a great adventure. So I'm not a hero. Me and the Lord know that. I was just a kid having fun. World War II was the greatest adventure of my life. 95% of it was pure fun. 5% of it wasn't, and I can't talk about that. That's it. Father God, King of earth and nations, keep your sovereign hand upon our sons. Give integrity, strength, and honor until this fight for freedom has been won. 
God bless our sons, our fathers, and our daughters. We place them all in your omnipotent hands. We give them up for justice, hope, and freedom. God is our rock, and on him we must stand. Liberty calls for valor and for courage. She pleads for men and women to lift her torch up high. She sheds a tear of sorrow for old glory. Remember why, she cries, we fight and die. Remember why. For God and home, for love and for our country, we give our sons and daughters and fathers life's very best. O oh God, our help in ages past and future, we seek your face, our nation, now to bless.